Hello. Today we look at a very interesting topic. Uh, the ways in which interpretivists make knowledge claims. It's a particularly interesting subject because interpretivists, in contrast to positivists, uh, deny uh, any objective means of assessing knowledge. Interpretivists say that positivists need to get beyond their search for the equivalent of a methodologist stone and recognize the subjective nature of not only the social world but the enterprise of studying it. So how do you pull a rabbit out of a hat? How if you acknowledge the subjective nature of all research do you make claims uh, that you have knowledge and expect people to take them seriously. Let me start by noting that the kinds of knowledge claims that constructivists make, excuse me, interpretivists, although constructivists are clearly the leading interpretivist school in international relations, the kinds of claims um, they make uh, depend in part on the kind of knowledge uh, they seek. Many constructivists, as I noted in previous talks, focus on the reasons that people have uh, for acting um, as they do. So the question becomes, uh, how do we know that we've looked into the minds and life worlds of people in a correct way? Uh, other constructivists, interpretivists, are interested in constitution. Constitution is, of course, the process that brings actors into being, legitimizes them, and some would argue by accepting them in particular roles in society, gives them rule packages, goals, and procedures to follow. So, in contrast to positivists who look always uh, for either causal explanations or for predictions based on associations, interpretivists, uh, some look at problems of causation and others uh, examining constitution have to propose different ways of assessing uh, how we assert this process of constitution. I think that the best way of unraveling this puzzle is to discuss three very good uh, pieces of work and then draw general conclusions uh, from them. Uh, the first is not only a good piece of work, but a classic study of social science, uh, Marx Weber's Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. As I'm sure you all know, Weber argued that capitalism was a modern Western phenomenon that it was ultimately attributable to the Reformation and a particular kind of Protestantism best characterized by Calvinism, which assigned uh, people as being chosen or not in the eyes of God uh, from birth. Well, how could you know if you were chosen? The chosen were generally successful. So by making yourself successful 
banner seen as legitimate by this religion, you could enhance your chances of being part of that group, or at least convince yourself that you were. This led to a series of real-world practices, including the belief that labor and duty were central to human beings, that saving, investment, hard work were critical signs of being chosen. This, in turn, led to the kind of behavior that resulted and accelerated capitalism and economic development. So Weber is working through uh, individuals, but individuals in turn are a product of their society, and that society in turn is shaped by a religious transformation and the values uh, it encouraged and enhanced. Weber makes clear in this book and other writings that he's interested in a singular event, in this case, the advent of capitalism, that he's telling a causal narrative about it. And that causal narrative, while focused on individuals, ultimately is not interested in an in, in efficient cause, but in deeper underlying causes which he finds in the social configuration of values and beliefs. He has an emphasis on the mechanisms that link changes in belief to practices and the practices to capitalism. So in his view, this causal narrative can be evaluated on the basis of its internal and external claims. Is it logical? Is it consistent? Is there a compelling chain of logic between antecedent and consequent? Is it consistent with what historical evidence is available? And can it be subject to counterfactual evaluation? Could we remove uh, one of the conditions and see whether capitalism would develop. Uh, can we play a game, remove, for example, the Reformation? Or alternatively, can we find a real world uh, counterfactual, as Richard Cobden did in this case, uh, looking at cantons in Switzerland, some of whom were Catholic, some of which were Protestant, and others were mixed. He came up with a measure for their degree of economic development and found that the most developed ones were Protestant, the least developed were Catholic, and the mixed ones were in the middle. So a kind of real-world experiment that incorporates uh, counterfactual assumptions. Uh, for Weber, the ultimate test of knowledge was external. Uh, to what extent does this understanding help us address real-world problems? And you could argue uh, in a simplistic way, as Richard Cobden did, that it suggests that economic development depends, in the West anyway, depends upon a reformation. And he famously argued that um, Ireland would never develop until its citizens gave up Catholicism for Protestantism. Now, uh, in our eyes, this is not a compelling argument because we know that Catholic Ireland developed economically. In fact, uh, it has become uh, quite well off uh, relative to its former colonizer of, of Great Britain. And we also know in retrospect that there were a range of reasons 
most of them having to do with British landowning and the administrative law and procedures that kept it underdeveloped in the first place. So um, what we have here is a recursive process. We have a theory which is evaluated, its author attempts to offer compelling support. Um, others then may test it themselves or think about applying it to the real world. And what they learn about the real world can be fed back into the theory itself. So today, uh, there aren't that many people who are persuaded by Weber's Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. But there's no doubt that the process of developing the theory and its attempt to apply it to reality and what we learn from that led us to deeper understandings of theory. Now I'm going to give, I think, um, two examples. I don't think I have the time for the third. So the second example is a work interpretivist and constructivist that focuses on constitution rather than on causation. And this is Jens Bartels's uh, Visions of Global uh, Community, published in uh, 2009. Bartelson makes a very interesting argument about the relationship between our cosmologies and our political forms. Uh, he focuses on the West and offers us uh, a genealogy, as it were, of cosmology from the ancient Greeks to the modern era. And his particular interest here is the ways in which uh, thinkers uh, framed the earth, its land and sea components, its shape, and its relationship to the rest of the universe. Uh, it particularly focuses on the change from medieval to modern cosmology. In the medieval period, uh, cosmology held, of course, that the Earth was flat. The medieval Christians knew about the one large collected, connected landmass of what we call Europe, Asia, Middle East, and Africa. They imagined that Jerusalem was in its center, and moreover, that the Earth was in the center of the universe, and the universe began with the moon and went out to the stars and whatever could be seen by the naked eye. It was all connected, so the term that they had, a Greek word, oikumen, meant a community. Bartelson makes the point that it's not necessary to scale up to a global community from the state, that in fact the understanding or vision of a global community was in existence and in practice a regulative uh, concept uh, before the modern era. And with the modern era, it broke down because the cosmology changed. People now understood <coughs> that the earth was round, that not all land was connected, that people were dispersed, and that this territory and the sea around it could be mapped and laid out in two-dimensional ways that could be demarcated by dividers and geometry. This change in perspective uh, led to 
people focusing on individual territories and peoples in contrast to the notion of a global community. The maps which were the mechanism that mediated uh, this uh, created and even mandated the necessity of having boundaries and units that became states. It helped to constitute and then to justify the emergence of the modern state. And this can be examined in, uh, at the micro level by looking at uh, Philip of Spain, the first of the rulers to have his domain mapped not only to lay out its borders, but to describe the nature of its inhabitants and its natural resources and possible trade routes. So constitution here is important and the question becomes um, how do we assess it? Uh, clearly for Bartelson, uh, while he doesn't envisage it as a causal narrative, it's very clear that he's making links between what happens in the scientific, technical, and religious spheres and the ways they impede upon, if not shape, the political one. And he has mechanisms that can be invoked, um, like maps and readings of these texts uh, and how they shape the ways in which people think and were in turn then invoked uh, when talking about the state and talking about a single unified territory with a sovereign in contrast to the medieval norm of people who had all kinds of mixed rights over the same territory, a very different sense than the modern world and the state. Now, in effect, the Constitution has causal consequences, and we evaluate Constitution by asking what are its causal consequences, and then examining them and seeing if there is a compelling narrative the same way we would do with Marx Weber's Protestant ethic. Let's step back from these two works and come to the question of how we legitimize these tests that we're using for causal and constitutive narratives when, as Nietzsche and Weber so famously argue, the gods have departed from the skies. There is no cosmic order. There is no objective truth. At best, we have subjective evolving procedures. The interpretivist uh, take on this is that we have to be content with this kind of uncertainty. Rather than looking for logical warrants or near-perfect correspondences with a world outside that can be measured objectively, uh, we rather have to fall back on two kinds of, of tests. Uh, the first are research protocols. And research protocols that are uh, different from discipline to discipline, from field to field, and differ as well within fields from one approach to another. Uh, these protocols are developed by practitioners themselves. And they are open to challenge the same way 
their work is open to challenge. There has to be a dialogue that comes about through criticism and response, uh, review and response, that leads to, if not a consensus, at least a sharp understanding of where the cleavages are, where people disagree, not only about the work, but the kinds of tests that we're using to evaluate them. And, of course, the extent to which these tests have been applied with skill and finesse. Uh, there's no way around uh, such a subjective uh, approach uh, to knowledge. And where it leaves us uh, is with even greater emphasis on the understanding that social science is an ethical process. That those who are its gatekeepers must be the fairest and most open people in the profession. Uh, they must be committed to the values of the profession and not allow their own beliefs, uh, political projects, or career advancement stand in the way of how they behave. This is, of course, an unrealistic expectation. Uh, we know, and I've seen it personally serving on journal boards um, over the years, is that all of these three kinds of contamination are found very much at every level of the social science process. So it's an imperfect uh, process with particular schools of thought or approaches often managing to lock themselves in uh, through their control of institutions, grants, hiring, and others being marginalized. We have to recognize that social science is both an ethical but a fragile process. We have to become ourselves committed to maintaining these high standards because in its absence uh, social science can degenerate into propaganda. This is of course uh, precisely what some extreme positivists allege is happening. Uh, but the alternative that they propose, uh, the ostrich-like uh, burying your head in the sand and pretending that uh, what you're doing is objective and defensible uh, is only risible. And it may in the long term uh, encourage even greater dissatisfaction and rejection of any kind of standards. Thank you very much.